get up after this. I know, this is very soft for me. Okay, check one, two. <laughs> Okay, good evening everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Um, welcome to the Cambridge Festival. Um, without further ado, I will pass over to our lovely um, event for this evening. Thank you very much. You guys stand up. I can't, I can't. So, uh, testing, testing, can you guys hear me? I don't know if we can hear, fantastic. So listen, my name is, uh, first of all, I'm questioning your, your life decisions while you're here before Easter, but that's fine, you're here, it's too late now. You can't hear us. People can't hear me. I don't know why people can't hear me. Testing, testing, one, two, three, you can hear me. Oh, hi. <laughs> okay, fantastic. So, um, oh, there we go, now you can hear me, excellent. So I'm questioning your life decisions about why you guys are here, but it's a personal thing, you can't leave now, so thank you very much. <laughs> My name is Giles Yo, um, and this is uh, Nazir Habib. And, um, and we are very, very delighted to be here to have this conversation. We, I, I got slightly con concerned because normally I talk at people. I don't talk with people. That's not true. But I don't know what this conversation, hopefully this conversation will be enlightening, not only for you, but for me as well. All right. And we are here to discuss, as you can see here, hunger is rather grand almost. Hunger, how we eat or can't eat affects our mental and physical health. And we may and we will touch on elements, elements of this. But I guess I wanted to pose the challenge to you folks and, and, and what we're going to be talking about and what we hope to elicit questions from you folks tonight. And the challenge is this. So this is pre-COVID, so this might sound like a million years ago. But in 2019, UNICEF reported on childhood nutrition. Okay, and this was part of their childhood nutrition report. I'm not making it up. You can Google this. And, and they zeroed in, to my mind, on the issue at hand. And the issue at hand is, why are so many children eating too little of what they need, while an increasing number of children are eating too much of what they don't eat? Okay, and we are going to be tackling this from both these ends. I, I am someone who studies obesity, and which doesn't sound like malnutrition, but actually it is overnutrition, masking malnutrition. Nazia here will be talking from the other end of the spectrum. First of all, uh, um, you know, from a big macro uh, e economics perspective, dealing with things, but actually dealing with undernutrition. We can debate what malnutrition is, undernutrition under is, but we're going to see where we can actually meet, um, 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 meet in the middle. So just very quickly how this evening is going to work is um, I will set up my stall. I have a few minutes. Um, Nazia will set out her stall. We'll do a little bit of ping pong in terms of just asking a few questions. And while we do this, hopefully 20, 25 minutes or so, all of you intellectual people here will be considering deep and intellectual questions. Don't worry, we'll take all questions, deep, no, shallow and non unintellectual as well. Um, and then, and then it, 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 but we'll open to the floor, we'll have, um, and we'll have a discussion, and hopefully, and I'm hoping to learn something new, because I'm a rather myopic um, molecular biologist, really, in, in, um, in, in, in life. So, is that, was that, does that reflect accurately what we discussed? We, I, I had a drink before. <laughs> That I think that generally, generally ref reflects it. So, um, if I might, I'll open, I'll open the stool. So, um, as I said, I'm Giles, I'm, and I study genetics. I'm a geneticist, and I think being a geneticist is being a perfectly upstanding thing to do. You know, my mother-in-law still speaks to me, so that's a good thing. But, but when people ask what I study, and I say I study body weight, which I do, but on one end of the spectrum just happens to sit obesity, so I study the genetics of obesity, immediately I become the bad person. And I become the bad person because I'm perceived as giving fat people, overweight people, people living with obesity, terms I do not use in any pejorative fashion whatsoever, an excuse. Now, philosophically, that has always been an interesting take for me because if we were studying the genetics of anything else, cancer, dementia, arthritis, whatever, you know, I don't think, oh, I hope not, anyway, that people would think that this is, this is an excuse, right? I mean, I'd be trying to understand biology, mechanisms. I mean, God forbid, I might be trying to help somebody. But when we talk about body weight, suddenly there is this whole concept of choice, of, of, of bad habits, of slothfulness, of all, all of these things that suddenly actually come, come, come into it. So I study the biology and the genetics of, of, of body weight. But then... The, the issue is, and what people always throw at me is, number one, but we weren't 
uh, uh, we didn't have problems with obesity in the 1970s. You can turn on any te te television. You know, obesity wasn't a problem. I would argue that obesity probably was a problem, but not at the frequency it was back then, and that is true. Okay, and our genes haven't changed since the 70s, 80s, well, maybe for, I've been alive throughout the entire process, and so it has been a change in environment. And ultimately, what we now understand within the concept of the genetics of body weight. So first of all, the genetics of body weight is the genetics of the brain and how it influences feeding behavior. Okay, all aspects of feeding behavior, not just in people with obesity, but actually the full, the, the full spectrum, small, medium, large, the, the, the whole thing. But it's not only the genetics. Clearly, it's not only ge uh, uh, the genetics. We understand it's roughly about half. We can debate what, what that is later. But it's these people or the vast... It's people with susceptible genes meeting a risky environment. But what does the risky environment mean? And I think this is the tricky bit because your genes are static. Okay, you can measure your genes from the day you're born to the day you die. They don't change, okay? And so you can, you can do all kinds of things to them. Your environment, the broader environment, not just the environment in terms of your bedroom, the environment is volatile. It changes from the moment you draw first breath till the day you die, okay? And so measuring the environment, A, it's difficult because it's volatile, it changes, it makes a difference if you're rich or poor, it makes a difference how educated you are, it makes a, everything changes your environment. It makes a difference if you're at peace or at war, as we're going to discuss as well. That dramatically influences your genes, dramatically influences what, what, what is there. And I think that people misunderstand, whenever I talk about genetics, that first of all, I'm anti-physics. I'm not anti-physics, okay? Your genes influence why we eat, what we eat, how much we eat, and what we eat, you know, and, and all the kinds of your environment then modulates this. Do you get the food you need? What is available for you to eat? When can you get the food you, that, that, that you eat? Can you afford the food that you eat? Can you afford to cook the food that you need to eat? All of these things influence your genes. And ultimately, I think we need to talk about the merging of these two before we have a good idea on what to, uh, uh, what to, what to actually do. Okay, so in this, and this will be my last couple of sentences, I don't want to hog, hog, the, hog the, the floor, but the problem we have today, okay, is we are in currently still the sixth richest country in the world, but yet we have nine million people in this country with food insecurity, okay, which is a crime, I want to point out, okay? And so the question is this, why then in this country, in a lot of the higher income countries at any rate, why is socioeconomic status linked to higher risks of most disease, but higher risks of obesity, okay? And as I said, obesity wrapped up in, mal in, in, in malnutrition because I'll, the number of people that say to me, yeah, but, like, but if they're poor, surely they should be skinny because they don't have enough food. And I think that's an oversimplistic view of the situation we're in. What kind of food is available? What's the quality of the food that you're actually eating? Can you afford the good food that there's for you? What's the cheapest kind of food that's actually available to you? And these are things which, I'm a molecular biologist, okay? So I work with moving small colorless vials of colorless liquids here and there, you know? And I am here tonight to learn as much of you to actually understand the broader context of the, of the environment, the macroeconomics of the environment of what we actually have to play. So that's my stall. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Nazia. Now, the thing about Nazia here is she is a woman of many talents, many talents. Okay, first of all, newly minted as a professor. Everyone salute. Okay, yay, exactly. Thank you, thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, the, the, the second thing is she's got a multitude of masters. I can't remember what all her masters are, but, but she, comes, she, she comes, and a PhD, I don't remember, but, but she comes from, from a situation of systems engineering and macroeconomics and social science and bringing all three together. Now, what Nazia said that I was, uh, as we were having, she had a latte, I had a beer. But as we were having, as we were having our discussion, she said that I do action, what did, what did you say? You do action research. I do action research. It makes me sound like Superman. I, I, I don't do any action whatsoever, but I do action research. And so I guess what Nazia is saying is that she's trying to bring together these three apparently disparate um, um, fields into some kind of action research. Can you actually take the social sciences and provide some level of action to it. And, and so hopefully, with that, I'm going to pass over to Nazia. Nazia, your, this is not a debate, but your stall. Thank you so much. 
and thank you for taking the risk to come and listen to us today. And um, as Giles has already wowed you, I'll be on his halo effect because he's not newly minted. He knows how to be a professor. I'm a newly minted professor grade academic in this university. It took me two years to get to that point of applying for one year, took me one whole year, and then waiting for another whole year whether they will actually make the choice or not. During that process, my in-laws didn't talk to me because I didn't know what I was talking about. And this is why it's going to be a dangerous proposition for you, as Zal has said, to understand the complexity and the uncertainty within which we all live in as an individual human being. So his focus in individual human being, my focus as planet Earth as an individual entity. And my research is action research, and I'm going to define that from Giles' point of view, because it was funny when we were having this first conversation, I'm like, your discipline, you do action research. He's like, do I? And the notion of action research actually comes from a point of view of you have a philosophy of research and you ensure the purpose of that research is met with the function. In other words, Giles, even though he's looking at the molecular and the colorless information, He's looking at a human body to make sure that this human body will be addressing some problem. And it's, he's talking with the human to identify that problem. In our typical social sciences research, we do lots of literature review, lots of secondary literatures, and very often we will make a hypothesis based on secondary information before we go to the primary data place. And when we go to the primary data place, to be very objective, we often do not personalize the situation to the point that we actually try to ask what action will we require to solve that problem? Because we are so busy trying to prove the hypothesis that we set out based on the initial work. And there's a disconnect. And that's the disconnect that drove me to the work that I do and I have the, I'm the head of a research center here at Cambridge called Center for Resilience and Sustainable Development. Our key methodology is doing action research. Every research we do has to have a collaborator who is not an academic, but a practitioner with an institution where they're the owner of the problem, like a patient. So that when we are studying the problem, we have a direct access to the problem owner to identify what evidence they actually need to solve their problem. And as a patient, when you go to the GP, they will ask, tell you, you have 10 minutes, just tell me the priority problem that you want to solve. Can be quite frustrating, but when they pressure you for 10 minutes to solve your problem, your brain automatically prioritizes the main key pain point that you are struggling with and forget about all the esoteric version of the pain. And you actually tell what you want. We, as social scientists, often glamorize the problematization so much that we do not contain ourselves to say, what is the problem of this individual patient, i.e. problem owner we are trying to solve? So that's action research, directly working with the problem owner, trying to find the right evidence for the priority of the solution that they need. So hunger is a priority problem for the world. Despite all the developments that we have seen around the world, how can we have nine million people still living in hunger in the United Kingdom? I come from Bangladesh. Amar Desen received Nobel Prize for his seminal work of understanding role of poverty in hunger. Bengal, 19th century literatures are riddled with poetry and stories and narrative of how people are going hungry to the point that people will look at a full moon and will imagine that is a tortilla. That's the roti that they don't have. So what is hunger? Hunger is basically, biologically, when you do not have enough to eat to satisfy your sensation in your stomach first. It isn't about calories, it isn't about nutrition, it's just about the sensation in your body that needs to feel it's full. So that's a very psychological element of it. What is hunger from biological science? Giles has the answer to it. What is hunger from political science is ability for a political organization, call it 
nation state to actually offer you food or give you the land and the instrument for which you can produce your food. What is economics has to say about hunger. It's about having the money to either invest in producing the food or having money to buy food, right? What is hunger from engineering point of view? That's my other discipline that I am um, catalyzing in social science is the engineering thinking, systems engineering. That is about connecting the value chain from the point A to point E where you're actually extracting the nutrition from the food, all of it is thought through. That is system engineering version of hunger. If you do not have the value chain and the supply chain put together, there is a break point. In that case, food doesn't arrive in your household. Food doesn't arrive in the store. You don't have access to the food. That's engineering. What other discipline have I missed out? Anthropology. Food, how you consume food as a human being, the culture, the story, that the vision and the mission that goes into cooking, that's anthropological version of looking at food, at hunger. If you do not have what Ajals has talked about, not having enough water, not having skill of cooking food, all of these are actually anthropological problem because it's about the context, the culture within which we are able to produce food. What is food from the climate science point of view? What is hunger from climate science point of view? The change in the climatic condition that is reducing, say, the uh, soil nutrition or the heat that is reducing the uh, productivity of wheat or you look at the toxicity in the air from the pollution that is coming in reducing your pollination that is food and that has a connection with hunger from climate science so this topic that we're talking today the knowledge of all of these disciplines that I bring together is action research because we are looking at the problem owner situation from all of systems approach. And all of system is about who you are, where you are, what you do, and how you consume food will dictate whether you're hungry or not. From the sensation all the way to the nutrition that comes together. And I will pause in this place and let Giles take over and start the uh, session because I hope that gives you enough sense, dangerous proposition that we are going to take you for a mind game of how to address this question for the world. Thank you. So you see, first, first of all, we have an issue here. I study one scale, she studies 16 scales of, 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 of the problem. So I think that, that's the issue. So I guess let's start macro and then we can do micro. In terms of the role of public policy, then let's deal with that. What is the role of public policy? In fact, let's do two things. Define malnutrition versus undernutrition. I think we are, let's at least get, get some definitions. On, on, on the floor of the difference between the two of those, what the scale of the issue is, and what do you think the role of public policy has to play in, in these two terminologies, malnutrition, undernutrition? I think that's a very interesting question, but I'm thinking from the benefit of our pop wonderful uh, audience here, wouldn't it be better to go from the body to the border? Okay, but the body to the border. So I start with the simple answer first. Yes, the okay. gene, because I think that will enable people to actually appreciate why malnutrition in and of itself is such a confusing term. So, okay, okay, okay fine, let's, let's do that. We'll start, I'll, I'll listen to you. Because policymaker does make, de depend on your definition. So I think, I think the, 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 the thing about malnutrition, I mean, as it says, is not getting the right nutrients. And this is why there's a confusion about whether or not obesity is malnutrition because look, you're well fed, you're large. How, how is that malnutrition? But you can be well fed on um, calories, okay? And, and for, for those of you who don't know me, you know I say calories don't count and people think I'm anti-physics, that's not true. And, and the reason is because calories are just one measure and they're nutrients blind. They don't tell you anything about it. So malnutrition could be you have too much sugar, fat, salt. It could be you have too little protein, you have too little um, fiber, you don't have enough micronutrients. And that can be true whether or not you have too much food of the wrong type or not enough food at all, okay, of, of the two. Now, in terms of the genetics element to it, I think because your genes, as I said, the genetics of body weight, we now understand to be the genetics of 
why, where, how much, where we eat. It influences why, why we actually do what we do. Okay? And so what matters is there are some people that are more driven to food and people that are less driven to food. And depending on what is placed in front of them, they will eat it or they won't do, do to their driver. Now, if you're in a situation in which the food in front of you is not great because you are in a low socioeconomic class, that is what you would eat. If you are in the same driver as me and I live in a leafy, very, very nice village where Deliveroo doesn't deliver, which is a blessing, I want to point out, then, then you end up eating the carrots and hummus in my fridge, whatever it is I, 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 have, I actually have access to. So your genes form an underlying driver as to why you may or may not eat. But because it has very little control in what is placed in front of you, then what in front of you matters as much as, 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 as what your genes do. Now, your genes don't only tell you how much to eat. They tell you whether or not um, you have a sweet tooth or not. Do I prefer fatty foods? Do I like uh, uh, foods that are more calor calorically dense or not? And all of this is clearly influenced as well, as well by hunger. But so I think that, that that is probably the statement where your genetics influences all of the actions that you have of your drive towards the food, but it can't control the food that's actually in front of you. So that's actually a very important thing to remember on the, uh, on the genetic side. And when we're doing, talking about public policy side, oftentimes that's not at all the consideration because uh, majority of the conversation on hunger and malnutrition actually dominated by the access to the nutrition point of view, which is not the body's own access triggers, which is the genetics, it's more triggers of the political economics and other exogenous effect to the context within which you are having access to food. And so there's a couple of definitions that I'm gonna throw at the audience right now. So hunger, quite a lot has to do with the sensation of your body feeling full, right? So that's very generally understood. Malnutrition, as the word mal means, poor or bad nutrition, right? So then the conversation there, as geneticist you mentioned, is about your body's ability to consume the food, to break it down, to be attracted to the food. And chronic malnutrition means that whatever reason that persistent happens over time to multiple people, over a period of a year, because as a policymaker, you need to look at the quantitative elements to it so you can think about, is it something that we need to do something about it? Then it becomes a chronic malnutrition. Chronic malnutrition, when you think about it lasting for over a year, means that the political economics of that nation state or the domain of the geography could be a small state of a larger country like in the United States, lots of pockets of poorest community for longer than a year suffering from not having good nutrition. So that's where the link between malnutrition and the public policy comes in. On top of that, if it happens at a situation where countries are at war or the climate change is threatening the production system, then you're now looking at the other level of malnutrition that is linked to not politics or economics, just the geographical condition and the climate change threat. So now, the debate on hunger and malnutrition has actually gone beyond the spectrum of just body feeling happy and healthy with the nutrition that it is getting, but also where the body is located. So policymakers globally also have to consider the people quantity residing within a geographical footprint. In other words, school meals, hospital meals, restaurants, all of these become part of the headache for the policymaker to make sure there are enough food available for the population who are living within that within that geography. So public policy point of view of hunger is actually very complex and multidimensional and it actually has much more granular and nuanced misunderstanding on the propensity of how even consume food has to do. So that's where the behavioral or psychology of food comes in. So, so I'll in, pause in that. So your interest is in Nina, you said, but uh, mm. North Africa and Near Eastern, uh, what, what? That's the recent project for with the food and agriculture organizations. Uh, North Africa and Near East region is one of the regional headquarters of the FAO, where we have a- FAO big, is? 
Food Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, where we have a large project with them to train 15 countries of the North Africa Near East region, shorthand NINA region, uh, to deputy minister level on teaching them on systems thinking approach to hunger. All of that's eight discipline that I have introduced you today, those are the eight discipline we are harvesting insight for the literature, from, from their literature on what hunger means and trying to empower the political leaders who are appointed and also uh, elected to find solutions for their own countries. So we are co-creating solutions, co-creating a mental space for the NINA region leader to find how to improve nutrition for their people because the genetics of their people are different than the genetics off of which those literatures are often written, namely in the West. Now, I just want to point out about the, when, when you say the genetics of, of these people, the genetic, yeah. genetics of people, a, a big problem, and I want to point out that all of the genetics that we have done, a big problem is 85% of the open access genetic information that's available, the cohorts and everything that's out there, are in white northern European Caucasian. That's, it was where it was started. This is where the, 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 um, the technologies and stuff were actually were matured. The problem is, if we only study with a myopic view on the genetics of one type of people, it doesn't answer questions about our ability to handle nutrients, about, about mm -hmm. anything else from, from, around, from around the rest of the world. In terms of who else ranks, the Han Chinese, because the, the Chinese government are throwing money at this, uh, are, are beginning to come up. Asia, South Asia, there, there are numbers that are actually kept coming up. In terms of black Africans, less than 1%. In fact, probably less than half of 1% of the genetic information that's available for analysis, for talking about this, is actually available open access. So, sorry, I just, just, no, just, just to important. jump in there to point out that actually we don't have anywhere close to the amount of information um, 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 that, that is required. One quick question. And I just want to, yeah. before you come to the question, yeah. because it's a discussion based, I think because of that reason, Action research type is actually, I would say, a band-aid to this problem of not having any enough data that you are co-creating solutions with the problem owner because we do not have that. Because, you know, everyone talks about evidence-based policy making. And I find it quite confusing myself, even though I, 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 I am someone who, uh, in the business of creating evidence, if enough of you believe in something, no matter how wrong it is, and you know all the history of genocides around the world, that isn't enough of an evidence to change a country's mind and go and do atrocities around the world. That's evidence, pure and simple. And I think when we run after evidence like that, we become another type of myopic patient because we're not focusing on situation where you don't need an evidence. What you need is to come together and co-create. So I'm going to throw up another word at you, science of co-creation. I think that's what we are doing in my research center. We are developing tools and techniques and methodologies for the region, for the countries where they do not have that kind of granular scientific evidence to be so objective than say this is the right approach. In that case, whatever the decision the evidence-based policymaker are maybe making are still subjective. Let's get this clear. Evidence-based policymaking does not mean that it is fully objective. There is still subjectivity in it simply because our cognitive lenses are filled with cognitive biases. And it is not a filter that you can just take out, clean it, and put it back in. And that's where I think the, the geneticist like yourself has to collaborate with someone like me and actually get more interesting studies done. And Sanger Institute is da just down the road, and I was one of the advisors within the cohort they brought together on ethics of genetic, uh, genes uh, genetic science because there is a misunderstanding here in developing countries and emerging countries because who owns the rights of their genetic knowledge? Yeah, yeah. And that's a big governance problem for science and policy. So I have, I have been adv um, advising Sanger Institute on that one, and they now actually have a very robust policy on that. So over to you again. So just checking the time so that people have time for questions. I got one more question for you before we throw it out. Yeah. We throw it out to the audience, because I know you guys are itching, hopefully, for, for, for questions. <laughs> but let's then talk about uh, the problem, the challenges that you have. You, you talk about all the systems, you talk about people, the stakeholders, everyone is there. 
What happens if you then put the area into conflict? What happens if suddenly you have war, you have all kinds of, we're, we're in an unstable world. How does that affect the equation? How does that affect mm -hmm. the algorithms of trying to figure out how to feed people and now suddenly you throw on top of that war, conflict, stress. Mm -hmm. how, how does that influence the thinking, the algorithms, feeding people in refugee camps? How does that actually play out? Well, I think I'm going to give a short answer because I think your answer is going to be much more interesting oh, than it? mine. Oh, shoot. Yes. Okay, right. Go. <laughs> because my answer is widely written on newspapers and, and everywhere else, those who are interested in global politics and hunger, which is used as an instrument of uh, mass destruction uh, nowadays. What is, from my point of view, we, we there is two element that I think we can do, because I'm going to go to the pro solution point, given that the work that we do with FAO in the region that is currently overwhelmingly um, stressed from climate change point of view and also from the political uh, uh, destabilization that is happening re region-wide and also have a spillover effect over here, is that the food aid boxes or what is going in those trucks we need to do further investigation into those food boxes to make sure that there are right kind of nutrition for children under five. And this is very important because 50% of children under five are currently undernourished globally. And the key word there you started with is the undernourishment, which is even if you're living in a richer uh, part of the world and have all the access to the food, Remember the sens sensation of your body is different than the actual nutrition intake in your body. They can still be undernourished. So 50% of the world children under five are undernourished. That's an alarming number. And I don't think that we're doing enough research in this as, as both as a social scientist and as a biological scientist to look at what kind of micronutrition a child needs from a very early age all the way to the five years because they grow so fast. Those of you who are parents would know that. Those boxes, I wonder, because it's often it's a black box, because a lot of not-for-profit, goodwill, good intention, people put their money and efforts into creating those boxes. They go on a truck and they go out there. Sometimes they even sit there for days in end, in heat, and God knows what condition, food do get spoiled. There's a very little consideration into the user side of that for children under five. And number two is that for children under five who are in conflict, currently living in insecurity, there's a huge mental um, pressure these children go through. And the mental health ability goes back to the gene structure. And I wonder how that gene is changed because of the stress that they have and chronic malnutrition that they have so that when they grow up as an adult, to what extent they will be able to make good choices for their countries and for the world when they live in the same kind of complexity or more complexity and uncertainty. And that's where suddenly me, the optimist, and uh, someone who lives in the abundance because I have so many disciplines that I work on, I feel like knowledge is everywhere, suddenly become very nervous and insecure because I do not see where feeding our children under five with enough quality of nutrition and not giving them the power to become a better global citizen to solve some of the silliness and the craziness that currently the world is going through. It's not a matter of backdoor diplomacy anymore. It's not a matter of who has more and who doesn't. It's really a matter of us as a human, as a species to survive. We need to address climate change and we need to address conflict because these two are feeding each other and there is no way out of it other than co-creating solutions. So that would be my point. Nutrition boxes, maybe you can answer this for the United Nations and others who are creating and carrying those boxes to those conflict regions. So, we're now gonna, with that, we promise to end on a, on a, on a more uplifting note in a bit, but I think we <laughs> need to, but we do need, we do need to enunciate the problem. And this is a problem, I think we agree that it is a problem that's out there. Have we even thought about it? Have we even, how much thought have we given about these food boxes? We were discussing previously that fine, nutritionally some things have been thought about, how much protein, how much macronutrients and stuff like that. But you were just asking, okay, if you supply lentils, which is fine, it's very, very good for you. Is there enough water in the region to, 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 to boil it? If it's, 
is there enough heat? What sources of? If you supply a can, do you suddenly do you have the tool to open the tins? There are many questions that actually I did not even think about. But let's throw the questions out um, to to the audience. Do we have questions, sir? Oh, we wait, wait for the microphone, please. If you can um, give your name as well, that'd be that'd be great. Hello. Oh, can you hear me? All right. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. oh, yep. Thanks. Thanks very much. Great. Great speech. Uh, I don't know if this is a, a question that's a little bit off topic, but how, like as a society or whatever, how do we accept different types of uh, bodies? You know, people that are a bit bigger or people that are a bit more plump, but at the same time be, I'm kind of worried about you. I think if you were to lose a bit of weight, it would be good for your health. Do you understand the question? I do understand the question. Yeah. I think it's a more complex question than you might actually yeah. imagine. I think, um, okay, it's, it's not that off topic to be, to, to, to be fair. I think it, it, it boils down to this, okay, in terms of we think too much about weight and not enough about health. I think ultimately that is what the situation is, is because you can have people who are in larger bodies but are actually healthy and people who are skinny and are not. Okay, ultimately, that, that, that's going to be the situation. It's true that on average... If you are heavier, you're more likely to be unhealthy, and if you're uh, uh, lighter, you are less. But actually, there's going to be people on the other side. The moment I think we begin to discuss health rather than, dude, what is this, right? That, that kind of situation, I think we're on, we're on better ground. Because then, to my mind, that's more empathetic. Because then I'm not trying to put a number on you. I'm not trying to do... And if there is some form of um, empirical factor, your glucose levels are a bit weird, my heart is not doing its job whatever, then you're talking about someone's health. What do we, what can I help you as a parent, partner, friend, whatever, okay, to, to, to actually improve your health? That's the way to do it. Because the moment you talk about someone's weight, I think you lose a large percentage of human beings um, 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 sat in front of you. And so that's, that's the way I would do it. I would speak about their health, not about our weight. We obsess too much about, about weight, uh, would, would be my view. Questions? Yes, sir. Well, okay, we're going to have the... Um... Okay. Name? Max. Hello, Max. Do genes contribute to how you go to the toilet? Which part of the toilet? <laughs> number one or number two? I thought, okay, but don't answer the question. <laughs> how is probably general biology, okay, where you've got to have a number one, you've got to have a number two, we have one tube that here and one tube that's there. And as we eat food and it goes through and your body breaks it apart, that's the how and it happens. How often, okay, does, do you go more or less often when you eat different types of food? Do you go have a tummy ache or not with different types of food? Does something happen to your blood sugar levels that suddenly makes you go number one more in the thing? That has a genetic element. So the how is the same for everybody, we hope. Okay, the how often, the why, the when, the how you feel when you're doing it, that is where the genes lie. I'm going to ask a question. Please. Recently, there has been some studies done, and Max, you probably, I hope it goes over your head, <laughs> but there's others that how heat has been um, changing women, women body in uh, going to the toilet, especially in developing countries where there isn't enough of it. And I wonder what would be your answer on that if women in, say, in agricultural field, you do not have enough water source to drink throughout the day, you do not have enough toilet to go and use, will your body's gene over time change as a reaction to the climate change? And the babies that will come from those mothers, will they carry that gene uh, footprint? So I'm not an expert at this at all. However, we, ha I, we have actually been in, be, been in discussions because climate change is obviously an, an issue. Heat is an issue. And this, I'm not talking about 50-degree heat. I'm talking about just chronically a few mm. degrees changes. There have been discussions not only about how it's influencing not only fertility and metabolism, but what happens when someone is pregnant during, during the heat. What happens, for example, with rates of lactation? And I think there is evidence from animal research at any rate that these changes in heat will make a difference. And so I think that it is absolutely crucial we do understand it because the answer, is, well, two things, two problems. Mm. 
Women's health is criminally understudied for reasons that we shan't go into today, not the topic of this discussion. And so we do need to actually to, to, mm. to, to, to look at that. Um, climate change influence on health rather than everything else is also criminally understudied. But I think certainly from animal work, those two are linked for sure. And I think that's also why the criminally understudied, those 50% of the malnourished global ch children number that we throw at, majority of them are female children. And that means that we actually have a huge amount of criminal activities going on in our academic fix. world. That we can fix. There was Somebody a question. should police us. There was a question over here. Ma'am. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. If you were Keir Starmer, what would be the key public policy advocate, um, public policy that you would implement to help obesity in this country? Oh, easy. Uh, uh, easy. It, made me, it might make me sound like a communist, but the answer is to make healthy food cheaper. To make healthy food cheaper. At the moment, the healthiest options that you can get, sadly, for reasons, food systems and everything, are not the healthiest. They're just not. Usually because of food systems and economies of scale that actually that, that mean that that's the situation. Shelf life, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'm not just talking about giving people carrots. I, I understand that clearly carrots are healthy for you, but actually that making healthier options. Sometimes you need a treat. Sometimes can you make a healthier chocolate bar? I'm not saying a chocolate bar is healthier than a carrot, but sometimes you eat a carrot, sometimes you eat a chocolate bar. So I think the answer is to make healthier foods cheaper. People ask me, well, hang on a second. Shouldn't we be taxing unhealthy foods? We can do that, I guess. I mean, my issue with taxation is always that it is indiscriminate, disproportionately affects the poor, and, and with all the greatest respects to lawyers here, makes lawyers rich. So those are the, 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 the problems. I think it can be used as a tool, but you have to balance it out with healthiness. So that Mrs. Smith, with three minimum wage jobs, wandering into a, a, a supermarket with a tenner to feed her family, at the moment, she comes up with the un most unhealthy options. I guarantee you, all right, in this country at any rate. What, she, what we've got to make sure is that you, someone with a tenner to spend to feed her family of X, okay, is able to feed their family by default the healthier food. That's what I would do. Make healthier foods cheaper. So I'll add a little bit to that one with the uh, household budget situation in this country. And I'm going to add a little bit detail on the uh, healthier food making cheaper because the inflation has a lot to do also on the production line before the food comes to the, um, uh, the uh, uh, shop. So I think the macroeconomic condition in the, of the UK government currently is actually quite depressing. And there is an element to that macroeconomic conditioning of the food chain because it is market-driven solution. It has to be addressed by some regulatory framework that will say these are the healthy food that has to be price controlled. Taxing does have its uh, problem. However, if you do use good, you know, there's a regressive taxing, uh, taxing policy, there's a progressive taxing policy. I'm not going to go into the detail, but as policymakers, they can actually use levers quite cleverly if they're consciously understanding the system through which the British household actually consume food. And this is not a rocket science, it's just about all of system approach, there are methodologies, there are tools that you can deploy and co-create neighborhood by neighborhood food pricing policies and you can use that to change the neighborhood level uh, uh, price control or price flexibility chart. Like the way you go to restaurants, it has a A, B, C, D grade of the quality of the food, uh, you know, the cleanliness. Why can't you have the same kind of price control, quality control on the grocery stores, so that the quality of food access to markets, Marks and Spencers is no, not substantively different from the one that you got from Aldi or somewhere else. So why is it not done? Here's the question then. They need to come to Cambridge to our school. <laughs> I'm being cynical. I think this all of system approach is something that is, is relatively newish to the social science field. I, as I said, I am owner of this center that I founded. We work with 75 countries. We're trying to popularize this, but it is a hard job. And that's why we welcome this conversation together. Okay, questions. I think the problem
problem is with um, wealthy versus poor, poorer countries is that um, our much poorer people in this country are time constrained. Time is the biggest killer. If I was, um, had limited time, if I could go to a supermarket and there'd be a box like HelloFresh, come get that, tenner, the recipes inside or a link to a video, YouTube, fresh food inside, all together, I don't have to shop, I run in, I buy my tenner, I run out, quickly watch on my phone the recipe, follow that, I guarantee you in 15 minutes you can put this together for a healthy meal. We've got to think differently for different countries what the constraints are, which is obviously what we're doing. But for me, I, even for me to do a Jamie's 15 minute I can spend an hour in the supermarket getting confused about where all the ingredients are. I then have a real problem with the mess afterwards. It's a nightmare. You've got maybe work to do afterwards. And sometimes you just take the shortcut and you might buy the carbs and what have you. So I, even, you know, I know I've got the money to buy it, but I'm just short of time. So I think contextual, I, I think that, that is an excellent point, right? You've got to make sure that whatever solutions are context dependent. You can, yes. One size does not fit all, we know this. And that's why the whole of system approach, when you take that methodology, that, that is the household level, community level. So because you know neighborhoods, can, you can identify neighborhoods based on what job they do, how often they're in their household, because that's what the census does. You can take a census record, take it. It's not really that hard, Giles. We can look at this from neighborhood to neighbor. You can look at even those people who are actually consuming hello food and look at how they do it. But ultimately, we as policymakers connecting with genetical science could do the mapping very efficiently and start creating variable solutions for variable families and neighborhoods and create localized price control or price flexible objectives so that everybody has access to high quality nutrition. I mean, that is an aim. I, I am cynical. I just don't know if any government is going to buy that, ma'am. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Melissa. Uh, what is your uh, view about the increased attention about ultra processed foods, UPF? Is it uh, a good thing? Is it a moot point based on uh, people's income? What are your thoughts? Do you know, it's entirely related, Od oddly enough, it's, it's obviously in the zeitgeist, it's obviously in everyone is talking about it too much in my view, but, but because then we're not focusing on the right thing. Here's the problem, okay? It is entirely related to what we're talking about because ultra processed foods is an imperfect way of trying to categorize the nutritional quality of food. That ultimately is the problem, okay? I think that um, despite all the debate around it, it's slightly navel gazing to my view, um, is that all of us want to do is in our own national context, regional context, neighborhood context, is to improve our diets. Why would we not want to do that? And more importantly, because unhealthy children, unhealthy adults, healthy children, healthy adults, to worry about this for children. Okay, so I think we can agree with that. And I think we can agree we're not going to shout at each other about that. The problem with ultra processed foods is, is in an imprecise measure, it groups too many foods together. They're uncontroversial, unhealthy foods, I think, okay? And they're foods which sort of sit in the middle, a bit of yogurt with some jam in it. Most supermarket bread. You can, guys can begin throwing bread at me, because, for those of you who read my Guardian article, as some, as some anti-bougie bread person, I'm not, okay? <laughs> I, I'm anti-people who make people who can't afford bougie bread to feel bad. That didn't make any sense, but you know what I mean. So I think that's the problem with ultra-processed foods. It, it, not as a... It's an imperfect and imprecise way of trying to categorize the nutritional quality of food. And I think we need to do better. I think we can be more precise. I think we can use units, you know, of, of, of measure. And that is what we need to do. Ultra-processed foods threatens and already is being used, to my view, to food shame people. And I don't think that should be the way that, 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 that we function. That's my view on ultra-processed foods. I'm going to add a historical bit on this because ultra-processed food, if you go back in the food history in the 1980s and 90s when the globalization became a big thing from the West to the rest of the world is consuming, was the food of the status. The more ultra-processed food you yeah. will have, like the whiter rice and the white flour, it was part of being richer and wealthier. So the other narrative to this is that now we're changing the narrative of what is wealthy and what is healthy is to become organic is to become all of this bourgeois stuff. But then the other bit of the problem of the story is that not all organic is actually 
A, environmentally friendly, and B, are actually the right kind of food you should be consuming. So it is a far more complex thing, and that's why I appreciate the cynicism about having a localized version of the food story because it's far too complex. Uh, but we have to be hopeful. We have to be hopeful. Now, I know there's a question. Is there a question here? I'll come back to you, sir. Oh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> we haven't yet spoken about uh, food and mental health. Mm -hmm. um, we've done a lot of work over the last five years looking at the effect on, of foods on depression in particular. Uh, basically, what we need as humans to have good resilience to depression from a food perspective is, one, a well-functioning gut microbiome, because that produces the neurotransmitters and other um, mental health uh, chemicals. Uh, to do that, we need to consume 30 different plant types or more each week. Secondly, we need uh, low or very, very low inflammation. Uh, and the balance of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids should be one to one. In our society, it's 20 to one, which is very pro-inflammatory. And thirdly, uh, mi micronutrients, uh, so vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients are vital and through, uh, in most people um, don't get enough. You know, children in the UK get 65% of their calories from ultra-processed food. Uh, and most of that does not contain the micronutrients they need. Uh, we should be eating minimally processed or unprocessed foods. Uh, and so from a mental health point of view, uh, I would challenge the notion that ultra-processed foods are as benign as you seem to be suggesting. Ah, ha, ha, ha. I, I think uh, there, there's also the emulsifiers and other components in the UPFs which damage the gut microbiome, damage the gut wall, and so on. But basically, we need to be moving back to unprocessed or minimally processed foods for our mental well-being. Um, and that's, I think, one of the significant drivers, along with technology, uh, of mental ill health in this country. So a couple of things. Um, undoubtedly, a good diet is going to uh, contribute to good mental health. I, I think, I think, I think well, we're including... Yeah, including I can just interject. Yes. The, the, the problem is that I would say most people in this room, yep. and indeed across the country, do not know what mentally healthful food is, and we need to be educating people as to what is mentally healthful. So... Okay, I did, that was a multi-part question and we have four minutes. So I think ultimately a, cu a couple of things. You can come and sp speak to me after in two seconds. I think that it is, to my mind, an overstatement about what very, very specific types of food are important for mental health. I think we need to have a good diet for mental health, okay? And, and we can talk about each of the individual uh, variations in a second. I'm not saying that ultra-processed foods are benign. I'm saying that ultra-processed foods is too broad a church to group the, the, the foods that are not benign versus benign, that under the ultra-processed food umbrella, there are benign foods and not benign, benign foods. That's my issue, okay, uh, um, um, for that. But no, I, I think we're, we have to be in agreement that, that you need a good diet for a full body of health, including, in, including mental health and including some of the, the, the details you've actually provided. We probably have enough question, time. Let's do one short question and we'll see, how, we'll see how that goes. Hi, my name is Diana. I wanted to ask about comfort eating versus non-comfort eater. Um, have you found, yeah, I know like it's normally psychological, but have you found anything genetic based? Okay, so that is an interesting, interesting question. Comfort eating versus no comfort eating, just to put simply, the people who are eat when they're stressed and people who don't eat when they're stressed. But it's the same hormone, it goes up, it's cortisol. Um, but yet, diametric opposites. I think the, the answer is this, mechanistically, we have no, I, I was gonna, we have no idea why. However, let me give you a, a sort of my understanding of, of why people comfort eat and why some people don't, okay? Being stressed, is unpleasant. And so you want unpleasantness to go away. And so you try and do something pleasant. Now for some people, that could be running a marathon, we had people, that, but for, for other people it could be bungee jumping, it could be obviously drugs of abuse, I'm not saying that, but for some people it is, it could be alcohol, for many people it's food. 
Okay, and so I think ultimately that's the reason. There's going to be a significant percentage of the population, myself included, that when I'm feeling stressed and I want to feel better, food is my quote-unquote high. It tickles the right notes in, in my head. For other people, it's exercise, and I think that's the divide. Genetically, there's ultimately good, there's undoubtedly going to be a situation we don't know what it is yet, actually, to be, to, to be fair, and mechanistically, we still have a long way to go to, un to under actually understand why as well. You I'm have, you have the, on the, that. Final, the, the final thoughts because you are Professor Habib. Go. Uh, <laughs> I think the, the last point on there and this point here actually are both very important for mm -hmm. us as academics and public society here to ask for more information or more evidence on because as the stress level globally is increasing, we are actually prone to actually having more processed food because easy to grab a bar of chocolate, right? So there, I see there's a correlation. I also see a huge correlation on that one with the, the food box that we, say, we are sending out to conflict region or to climate stressed environment, the flood and all the distress that we are having to make sure the micronutrition is there. Do we know, and I wonder if anyone is doing a research, like what would be a micronutrition based small satchel of, you know, food aid to go out and should that be also easier to pass through those checkpoints because you don't have to give those prongs and instruments. I don't know. That's a new food science and I think we should invest in food science with the idea of a peaceful world, not the world that is going to serve only one group of population who can afford it. And that would be my last thought. So, uh, for all. ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've learned as much as I have um, um, over... Have, have I finished early? I just want to talk before. I don't want to... Oh, there's three more minutes. We got one more question. Can we can do one more question. Ma'am, you. I'll speak to you after. Back there. Sorry, I nearly shortchanged you. Don't, don't. Hi, hi my name is Valerie. Um, I'm really interested in the work you mentioned in the NENA region, working with different government stakeholders. And you mentioned the lack of data as a major challenge. Aside from that, what are the other major challenges that they are you know, telling you that are stopping them or inhibiting them from making good nutrition policies? As I mentioned from the beginning, is that we do not do co-creation as an evidence-based research or evidence-based space for policy making. That's a new science, and we are really actively trying to introduce this to uh, the Nina region because, as I said, like uh, my colleague here, Giles, when you work with the problem owner, they know the solution, most cases. And they oftentimes, even as a patient, you'll go to the doctor saying that, I think I might actually have this. Why don't you look into that? Actually, there are studies found that 60% of the time, patient actually knows what the diagnosis is. You just need someone to approve it. There's a co-creation between doctor and patient on finding solutions. We don't do that. That would be my first answer to that. Those countries currently in the NINA region needs to co-create their own solutions and not depend on external parties or forces to tell them what the solution is. And when they do that, they're not accepting it, cortisol level goes up, and they're not actually focusing on the right aspect of the nutritional policy. Food nutrition box is one of the easiest thing I think we all ought to be prioritizing, but no one is talking about it. Why aren't we putting micronutrition satchel in all the boxes to make sure all the adults, age group based, separate them, age between one to five, five to ten, because that's how I buy my micronutrition from the grocery stores or from the health stores. This is systems thinking, and this is where you can find more collective operational space. And actually, some audience over here might actually run a business out of it. I think there's a huge business potential to this. So listen, uh, Nazia, thank you so much for, for, for educating us far more than me. Uh, thank you uh, to, to, to the audience here for being here and listening to us rabbit on. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you for attending the Cambridge Festival. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much.